Many thanks and a um, very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming along tonight and in particular thank you to the British Council for organising this evening and for the, the whole programme. Um, really looking forward to the workshop we'll be doing over the next couple of days and hopefully this evening will give a, a bit of a taste of the different areas that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days. Um, so just to introduce myself, um, my name's Simon and I describe myself as a cultural entrepreneur. Um, now I'll go into detail about what I mean by that later, um, but first of all I'll give you an example of the two businesses that I've set up over the last 10-15 uh, years or so. The first one is culturelabel.com, uh, which we created about a decade ago. Um, now this was really looking at the combination of consumer trends, cultural assets that we have within, this, within all of our institutions, and really looking at demand on the high street for unique, different, interesting products that, lo and behold, our museum stores, our affordable artists, a whole range of people in our museum and gallery environments actually had. So we created Culture Labels, a really simple idea, bring together 800 of the biggest, best museums, galleries, arts organizations around the world, put them onto one website, and then market that store to a high street audience. So how do we take all the great product, all the artist design products that we have within museum stores, how do we take the affordable art that we have within galleries, and how do we position that into a, to a high street audience looking for something special, something different and unique? Um, so it was a very simple idea, but at the time we were very concerned that the world's biggest seller of art is a chain called IKEA. And if you know the IKEA type of art, it's very sort of um, print on demand, it's very sort of same, same, same types of artworks that you get there. And for the same price as a, limit, uh, as a piece from Ikea, you could get a limited edition print from a Turner Prize winning artist from the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. So we were seeing that price wasn't a barrier. What was a barrier was getting what we were doing as a cultural sector out to where the people were, on the high street, at home, at work, at school. And that's basically, for me, what cultural entrepreneurship is all about. Taking what we do as a, an arts and cultural sector and putting it into the lifestyles, the everyday lifestyles of the people that, are, that don't know yet that they're wanting to experience what we do. So the whole cultural label experience, we ran it for about 10 years before selling it in 2014. And the whole experience was one of an e-commerce startup. So we've had a lot of experience sort of building it through several rounds of funding, getting venture capital investment, working with venture philanthropists, people who want both cultural outcomes as well as commercial outcomes, and a whole range of kind of issues to do with building an e-commerce startup from, from nothing to about 250,000 visits a month uh, for people looking for this kind of work from museums and galleries. What was great about Culture Label for me was that if we were successful, the organizations that were on our site were also successful. About 90% of our revenue went back out to the cultural sector. So we took a commission on average of about 10% of all the products we sold, which meant that as a new revenue stream for the cultural sector, it became a really interesting driver of, of different types of revenue that could sit alongside public funding and sponsorship. Now we also, when we first started, wrote a series of books, um, but the first one was called Intelligent Naivety. And this was really looking at our explanation of cultural entrepreneurship. We, we describe it as a handbook for the creative entrepreneur. And there was a lot of research at the time being done around uh, entrepreneurship. What makes an idea more likely to be implemented? What makes an idea more likely to be successful? And there's a whole academic sort of um, background that in 2008 was really starting to, to develop and, and really starting to come up with some really interesting sort of work around it. So we took this and applied it to the cultural sector. So if we're looking at entrepreneurship in creative and cultural sector, what are the strategies that we can do as organizations that have little or no money to make an idea more likely to happen and be successful? Because the whole model of cultural entrepreneurship is the idea of making something out of nothing, just like any good entrepreneur. It's not about waiting for a check to arrive. It's not about waiting to be financed. It's about creating the idea of momentum. It's about using and leveraging partners. It's about a whole series of strategies that we can implement in order to get the ideas to fruition. 
So that book and, the, and several others are available for free download at uh, remixsummits.com forward slash books. So do go and grab yourself a, coffee, a copy. Um, we also, sort of, on a, in a more hands-on way, support culture entrepreneurs in London. Uh, this is Shoreditch, which I'm sure quite a few of you are, f are familiar with and have visited. And in Shoreditch, we host a co-working space, uh, the Remix space, where we house 60 entrepreneurs. They're all working in the creative and cultural setting. Um, and really looking at ways in which we can grow these enterprises into scalable um, social and cultural enterprises right across the spectrum. So then the final bit of introduction is Remix, which is the conference that we've been running since 2012. Um, and as mentioned in the introduction, we run it in London, New York, Sydney, Dubai, Perth, Melbourne, and several other locations each year. Uh, we've just had the London one in January. We've got New York coming up in a couple of weeks, followed by Istanbul the week after. And the idea behind this is to bring together um, the creative leaders from across the cultural sector, from the technology world, and from business and, and entrepreneurs to get the best brains in a room to swap notes, share strategies, and really start to explore some of the common challenges that all these different sectors are facing. So often it's the technology sector talking to the technology sector or the creative sector talking to other creatives rather than swapping and discussing between ourselves what the opportunities for collaboration and common answers are. So we bring those, those thought leaders together. We have thousands of creative leaders attending these each year. And the idea is really start to get more and more collaborations forming between those sectors. So that's the introduction, uh, a bit of background to, to who I am and, and what we've been working on recently. So tonight's talk is going to be looking at this opportunities around arts, technology, and entrepreneurship. But we're starting at it very much, as I've mentioned in the introduction, from the perspective of cultural enterprise, cultural entrepreneurship, and the ability to create um, new enterprises from creative and cultural assets. Now, The Atlantic in 2015 ran a big piece on the death of the artist and the birth of the creative entrepreneur. A very controversial statement, but increasingly we're finding that all artists are needing to have the skills of entrepreneurs simply to function or to succeed. In order to attract audiences, in order to attract revenue, in order to attract um, levels of uh, support, the skill of the entrepreneur is becoming more and more important for all of us as individual artists or as cultural organizations or as creative businesses. And the ability to pick and choose the strategies between these different industries, between culture, technology, and entrepreneurship, is becoming more than just a simple nice to have. It's becoming essential to our existence. And it becomes more and more important as we're going forward and being more and more disrupted. And I would argue that the cultural sector hasn't yet been disrupted. We've seen huge disruption in other creative industries like publishing, music, to name, quite, to name just two. The cultural sector hasn't yet had that wave of disruption that completely upturns business models or that completely transforms what we do as institutions. But we can guarantee that wave of disruption has started and is going to gather pace and is coming. And we need to be ready for it. We need to be prepared for it with entrepreneurial strategies, with deep collaborations around technology and digital, and also with a different mindset around the importance of this cross-disciplinary working. Now is the opportunity for these new models, for imagining different ways of working and reimagining that cultural experience. Most or many creative industries have been fundamentally disrupted, and ours is, is next. So we can look for different solutions to this. Some of the innovators within our institutions, those that are looking at doing what we do in different ways that work within our institutions, but that are considering different ways of doing approaching challenges. Others apply models from different industries, so that might be the events industry or the publishing industry, to think about what works in other industries and how can we apply that to the cultural sector? How can we take the best of publishing models and apply it to a museum? Or how can we take the best of live experience and apply it to an orchestra? Those kind of models are becoming increasingly prevalent. Equally, we're seeing disruption from the likes of Google or Facebook or Amazon or large 
internet companies that are transforming business models overnight. Amazon, for example, created the world's largest public library overnight when it allowed free sharing of e-books between uh, Kindle users in the, in the United States. Now, if we're seeing the public library model transformed overnight by an outsider like Amazon, what other disruptors are coming to the sector to reimagine what we're doing day in, day out? So a new generation of creative entrepreneurs are blurring these three worlds of culture, technology, and entrepreneurship. They can be commercial, they can be non-profit, they can be social enterprises, but those old dividing lines between culture, technology, entrepreneurship, or business are becoming less and less relevant. They're becoming more and more blurred. But by blurring those boundaries, we can find new ways of reaching much, di much more diverse audiences, as well as generating significant new revenue for, our, for us to reinvest in those core uh, requirements that we have as organizations. At the heart of this idea of cultural entrepreneurship is understanding our users, responding to their needs, taking them on a journey, challenging them with new things they didn't know they were going to enjoy, developing that deep, trusting relationship with our users, just like an entrepreneur would. That's the whole concept of creative entrepreneurship, cultural entrepreneurship, thinking like an entrepreneur, but using the assets we have as an institution, a cultural institution. So I just want to walk you through a few quick examples of what we mean by these creative cultural entrepreneurs. The first is um, a company called Dig Ventures, um, and they were originally started within the co-working space we host in London. Now, uh, Lisa, who's on the far right of the picture, um, I'd describe her as a frustrated archaeologist. Um, she saw the industry as quite stale, she was seeing limited people getting engaged with archaeology as a sector, but she was passionate about it. She absolutely loved archaeology and the, the discovery of new, new ways of, of kind of engaging people in that world of archaeology of which she was so passionate. So she took a number of trends and put digital at the center of her offering. So she used crowdfunding to crowdfund, crowdfund archaeological digs, where she got people excited about the actual process of an archaeological dig. She did live streaming of digs so that people could see things as they were being dug up at the ground. They did online events. They did community building around archaeology. They did a big education program around archaeology. And that crowdfunding initially raised about, I've done a conversion and it works out about 20 million rubles. I'm hoping that my conversion's roughly accurate. Um, but it was from people paying to participate in their digs. So not only did they get the money to fund the dig, but they also got the volunteers to actually do the digging as well. So it was a win-win for them as an organization. But best of all, they branded them Dirty Weekends. Um, to attract a new audience of, of experience seekers, people wanting to do something different for the weekend that might not visit a museum or that might not normally be interested in archaeology, but they were looking for a unique, interesting experience that they could get involved with. And then on the back of that success, they, invest, they attracted venture philanthropy funding. And we talk about venture philanthropy as this mix of, of people with, with money to invest, often angels, uh, that have spare money lying around that they're wanting to invest in a business, they're looking for a commercial return, but equally they've got a lot of sensitivity to the cultural returns or the social returns that they will get if that business in turn succeeds. So they attracted venture philanthropy funding of about 158 million rubles. Um, and that allowed them to scale up. They brought on Tony Robinson, the guy at the front, who is a TV presenter of Time Team and various other archaeological programs in the UK. And he was a, a very strong ambassador of this, of this cause. And that's a, a great example of this combination of business model thinking, dis digital technology, and, and new ways of reaching audiences, and uh, being driven by a really passionate cultural expert. The next example is called Retronaut. And this allows you to track time travel. That was the, the whole sort of emphasis of his brand. See the past like you've never seen it before. And if the previous example was a frustrated archaeologist, I described this as a frustrated archivist. Um, and he was sitting on thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs, thousands and thousands and thousands of objects that most people didn't even know existed, but that he was deadly, deadly passionate about. He absolutely loved the items in his possession. 
And he wanted to get them out to a much larger audience than the people coming through the doors of his archive. So what he did was create, a, uh, create an email list where every day he just emailed out a few of the best pictures that he found in his archive that day. And amazingly, because he has such a good eye as an archivist, over time it grew and grew and grew and grew to the point where he had 2.38 million followers that combined through his social channels, his email channels, he grew millions of people that were just watching what he was putting out each day to show the amazing items that he was finding uh, from the archives, initially his own archive and then beyond uh, across the UK and beyond that. Now, the impact was really shown in this when one day he'd posted an image from one particular archive in the UK from their collection, and they got in touch with him and asked him to take it down because he, he hadn't got permission to put that image up on his, um, on his uh, blog. So he did take it down. He had a policy that as soon as somebody complained, he would take it straight down. So he took the image down, and lo and behold, a couple of days later, he got a phone call from that same archive asking him to put it back up again because their traffic had plunged on their own site. And most of the referrals, most of the traffic that had been being sent to that archive, and we're talking quite a major archive in the UK, was being driven by this one-man band in his back bedroom with a WordPress blog. And that's the power of cultural entrepreneurship. This one-man archivist had more traffic than the National Archives in the UK. This shows the power of cultural entrepreneurship to really level the cultural sector and how we're able to imagine new ways of distributing, using technology to find um, new audiences for what we do and what we're passionate about in the creative and cultural sectors. From then on, he's gone on to do books, TV programs, a whole range of collaborations, and it's been a really interesting journey as a creative cultural entrepreneur for Retronaut. I'd absolutely encourage you to go and check it out and sign up if you haven't done already. But it also shows the, the danger of entrepreneurship and cultural entrepreneurship. Um, this US site, History in Pictures, um, saw the success of Retronaut and launched a competitor to it. Um, they got a lot more funding, so they got about two million US dollars, um, and that investment allowed it to grow into a much, much bigger site. So you can see by the numbers, they've got um, about eight million followers across Twitter and Facebook, a huge audience for a very similar product of archival photography uh, from a range of archives in the US and, and internationally. Now, it's really interesting in relation to those dynamics of competition and also showing the demand for well-curated cultural content through digital channels. We shouldn't be waiting for our audience simply to walk across the threshold of our institutions. Our audience is there. They're waiting for us to go to them. And we need to use digital technology. We need to use new business models to find those audience members and to take what we have to them, whether they're at work, whether they're at home, whether they're on the high street, whether they're at school, wherever they are, let's take what we've got and take it to them so then they can engage with us in exciting, innovative new ways. The final example of a creative entrepreneur I want to give is is a firm called Mojis. Now, this is slightly different because this is more on the supply side of, um, of entrepreneurship. And this was a frustrated musician. Um, this time, he was wanting to create an opportunity for anyone to engage with, with music, even if they weren't able to play an instrument. And he wanted to create a bridge between the physical and digital worlds. So they raised 4.5 million rubles through crowdfunding in order to launch this, um, this bit of technology, uh, Mojis. And this basically turns any surface into an instrument. But it's not a random instrument. Wherever you touch plays a note, and it senses how, hard, how, how heavily you, you press it. Um, it. Also, if you press the same place twice, it remembers what you've pressed. So you can turn the room into an instrument. And it allows anyone to create music without being able to play an instrument. And it really opens up and democratizes that idea of creating music and expressive creation of, of art. Now, they've been able to, um, to look at other opportunities for it, such as casual gaming, education. Um, and they've just also signed a new funding round of approximately 45 million rubles uh, to develop it in, a, in different directions as well. So in this case, looking at the supply side, how do we get a generation of creatives 
as well as how do we then distribute with the, with the other two examples, distribute what we do uh, to wider audiences. And then the final example, uh, digitaltheatre.com, uh, which we describe as a Netflix for theatre. Um, now, this is looking at innovation in distribution models. Um, and digitaltheatre.com is a great example of looking at the how to take the unique experience of a theatre show and capture it in such a way that it would work on a 2D television screen. Now, they, a lot of them are ex-TV professionals, uh, mostly from the BBC, but they, their big emphasis was on how to capture that moment, so it wasn't just a single camera pointing at a stage or a few cameras pointing at the stage. How did they take the user into that intimate theatre experience and capture different ways of, of really recreating or creating a new way of experiencing that theatre performance through, um, through television? In a similar way, we've got Marquee Arts, which has just launched, and they're focusing primarily on um, performing arts, including ballet and opera. And again, the emphasis is on how do we capture that in different ways, so it's not just a simple recording of a performance, but it gives you different views on that than if you were sitting in the audience of a theatre show. So the internet enables us to promote, sell, deliver directly to the user, and to do so, the in ways that competes with corporations and institutions, which previously had that monopoly on both marketing and distribution. This is an era where anyone can be a cultural entrepreneur. Anyone can compete with an institution or with a corporation and create a new model for people to experience cultural content. And that's really, really exciting. For us as a sector, it's the starting point for that wave of, dis of um, disruption that I'm talking about. It's the starting point if anyone that gets excited by the content we have within our institutions can come up with new ways of taking it to their users, can come up with new ways of monetizing it and creating new revenue streams around it, then that becomes a really exciting time to be working in the creative and cultural sectors. Now, live experience isn't, isn't, um, isn't missed out with, with this way of working as well. And Secret Cinema is a great example that I'm sure many of you have come across. Uh, but the live experience with Secret Cinema has been transformed by creative entrepreneurs. Now, this transforms the cinema experience to bring the film to life through immersive sets and experiences where you watch the film that they're showing, but you also explore the sets, interact with actors, uh, and really bring the film to life. And this, really importantly, isn't just for a great experience. It isn't just for a live experience. It also helps directly funds the arts organization, which supports short film creators. So, and that's called Future Shorts. So they're using the blockbuster appeal of sets like uh, Blade Runner or Star Wars to bring in the mass numbers, to bring in the mass revenue, which then in turn is being, pay, is then being used to pay for supporting a generation of short filmmakers and a lot more kind of niche artistic content that's coming through there. Here's one of, the most, one of the largest and most recent productions where they partner with Disney to take guests into the entire Star Wars universe. And it's interesting to note that the new Star Wars uh, world at a lot of the Disney parks is very, very similar in thinking to some of these models that were tested with Secret Cinema. And the scale was phenomenal. In 2015, they had 18 acres of sets. They had because of, the, the, of this single production of Star Wars, it meant that it was in the box office in the UK in the top 10 for 11 weeks, the performance that they were showing. And it had 100,000 people going through the doors in 100 days. Now, interestingly, the tickets weren't cheap. They were 78 pounds per ticket, which led to a box office revenue of 7.8 million pounds. So it shows that people are willing to pay for a high quality curated experience, immersive live cultural experience of this sort. Another example of, of theirs um, is Back to the Future, which they did on the former Olympic site in London. They recreated the whole Back to the Future experience, and this in turn attracted 85,000 visitors. Now, what was interesting about this as a live experience was it wasn't just the single site that they used, but they also had immersive experiences dotted around London to drive people to that core experience. So throughout, throughout the, 
city, they had these pop-up shops where you could go and get a milkshake as if you were in 1950s America, or you could go to the frock shop and, and get your clothing to then go to the main experience. So throughout London, you could go and experience bits of the universe of Back to the Future before then going to the main one at the Olympic site. And that helped with this kind of the marketing, but it also helped create this sense that something had arrived across the city for the duration of that performance. So if all of that gives us a glimpse into this exciting new world of creative entrepreneurship, um, one, of the most, one of the most interesting things for me is looking at how we can help transform our own abilities as institutions by working directly with creative entrepreneurs. And as I say, those entrepreneurs may be innovative intrapreneurs within our institutions. It might be people already working for us. Or alternatively, it might be people on the outside that have come up with new models, new ways of doing what we do. And I, I like to talk about this as the, the value chain of the cultural experience. Um, and if you look at the value chain of something like a museum or a performance, each bit of it needs to be faced with a question, can this be done better by a third party? And there are some good examples which I'll be talking about over, over the next couple of days, but for example, museum tours in the US are being done a lot better by Museum Hack than they are by the institutions. Museum Hack is a fantastic must-buy ticket in New York at the moment, where a group of actors, comedians, a whole range of people have got together to reinvent the museum tour. And it is one of those tickets that money can't buy because it is so popular. And it's driving people into museums that otherwise wouldn't necessarily be going there. They're targeting it at, at stag weekends. They're targeting it at business visitors. They're targeting it at a whole range of different audiences that might not step into the museum environment normally. And it's a really interesting example of a third party that aren't connected with the museums reinventing the whole museum guide experience and doing it much, much better than the institutions can. And then, that then allows for the partnerships between organizations like Museum Hack and the institutions that they're driving new visitors to. So over these next few days, um, I'm going to be doing this workshop looking at a lot of these examples, particularly in art and technology. And we'll be looking at developing audiences and distribution models, reimagining the visitor experience, using tech to create new artistic experiences, using it to operate more efficiently. But if we accept that creative entrepreneurship can help unlock some of these opportunities, I now want to spend the rest of the talk just dwelling on how to create the best environment for creative entrepreneurship, both within our organizations and by encouraging new collaborations between industries, creating partnerships between creative minds from across the cultural, technology, and business sectors. Right now, I'd want to focus on models for creating these new collaborations, since the best new innovations will be as a direct result of, those of, those, of the environment and also conversations that are enabled between those intersections of culture, technology, and business. So we tend to think about this as post-Silicon Valley thinking. This is how we refer to it in the Remix team a lot. Um, now, Silicon Valley is a unique success story. Um, it's created countless new successful startups. It's developed an ecosystem perfectly suited to nurturing new technology companies. But it's the result, I'd argue, of a very particular set of circumstances. And despite many cities trying, it can't just simply be replicated. Moreover, I'd argue it's quite a boring place to live. There's not much happening there besides technology. It's work, 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 and then a bit more work. There's very little cultural infrastructure there. There's very little to do in your spare time beyond go back to the office. And for those looking for a better work-life balance or for looking for a richer experience, that's why we're seeing the rise of creative cities biting at the heel and really competing with Silicon Valley as a place for tech startups. So places like San Francisco, New York, London, and many, many other cities worldwide are drawing lots of the technology talent and providing ecosystems that are beginning to rival Silicon Valley for the level of, of investment and also the ecosystems that are being developed around tech startups. Now, this might seem a long way from our discussions about culture and technology collaborations, but it's not. 
It's because the ingredients of all of this, of all these challenger cities, which Silicon Valley is missing, is their creative and cultural ecosystems. They attract creative tech and business talent because of the cultural sectors at the heart of these creative cities. And it's not just Remix saying this, Google says it as well. Um, it's this intersection of culture, technology, and business that the greatest innovations are to be found, which is why the old Silicon Valley innovations cluster model is no longer fit for purpose when it separates industries rather than creating meeting points between, the increasingly, between them. Increasingly, tech companies are saying the same thing. Alan Noble, chief engineer of Google in Australia, is saying that the, something that is important to understand is the big innovation opportunities happen at the intersection of different disciplines. It's when the cultural and creative industries meet the technology industries, meet the business sector, that the best ideas and innovations happen. Similarly, we talk a lot about STEM, uh, which is the idea of science, technology, engineering, and maths. We need to add in the A, and there's a big debate in the UK, as I'm sure there is over here as well, about arts education and ensuring that arts education is as important as science, technology, engineering, and maths. But equally, that, there's that X point. Innovation is computer science plus X, and that X can be anything. It can be finance, it can be arts, it can be advanced materials. It's the intersection of different ways of thinking, different minds that creates those opportunities for innovation. So that begs the question, how do we then encourage that cross-disciplinary innovation? How do we, as cultural innovations, become the place where different industries, different people meet, and how do we benefit from that as institutions ourselves? Now, this is nothing new. Back in the 16th and 17th centuries, we have the coffee houses or the salons in, in Paris. The idea of different industries coming together to discuss the talking points, the challenges, the questions of the day. And it was a hothouse of radical discussion and no hold bars debate. It was where ideas were born. It brought together artists and merchants, philosophers and engineers to discuss the key challenges of the time and come up with new ways of solving those problems. Out of these coffeehouse discussions came the modern stock market, much of the newspaper industry, the insurance market, and many, many, many other industries and companies. So what are the equivalent safe spaces for today? Where do people come to meet other people from other sectors, from other industries, that can then in turn benefit our institutions as the hotbed source of new innovation? One example of this is Second Home in London, uh, which is a co-working space uh, where tenants are quite, quite deliberately selected from a mix of different industries. Now, they create social spaces, they create a, a natural environment. There's a lot of plants, as you can see from the, the pictures. It's almost a forest when you walk into it. Uh, there's plenty of informal meeting spaces where people are just allowed to kind of bump into each other. And they've also got an events program which maximizes collaboration between people, mixing different companies together in the hope that then new innovations come out of that. And equally, in new locations where Second Home is about to launch, they do a pop-up version of it, a temporary version, um, and it tends to be sited in a local park, and it just gives people that experience of coming together to discuss common issues, common challenges. In Lisbon, uh, one of their latest examples here, uh, Second Home is on the floor above the Time Out food market. And that itself is interesting when we're talking about the power of curation and who the curators are now. Time Out, as a magazine brand, is becoming a food curator. They're choosing who goes into the food market and in turn creating a live experience for people to really kind of engage with that unique experience of food and drink with then the co-working space above. And that collaboration between Second Home and Time Out is itself a really interesting collaboration between the publishing industry and the kind of business support world. We're also seeing it in corporate models. This is Google's Arts and Culture Institute in Paris, um, which we work to help develop concepts for with them. Um, it's a space and a lab environment which encourages new innovations in both digital arts and technology collaborations. And as we go through, as we look at Google Arts and Culture and a lot of the work that's coming out of that lab, there's some really, really in interesting innovations at the very bleeding edge of performing arts as well as museums and galleries. 
Similarly, we see in um, artist-driven models, like Holtz Market in Berlin, where um, we've got artist-owned and run spaces uh, created in response to the gentrification of Berlin as the city, like many cities, is making it much, much harder for artists to be able to afford housing or to be able to afford places to, to live or work or studio space. Now, Hall's Market is a great example where they raised enough, com uh, enough money as a community to actually buy a portion of the city themselves. And they could run that area as a collective, as a collaborative, um, as a collaborative group. And then they generate revenue for their work through commercial nights, including music events and festivals. But it becomes a really important meeting point for a lot of different parts of the community and really interesting space for different people to come and meet. Similarly, how do we look at attracting specialized content creators? If what we're needing as a cultural institution are innovators and entrepreneurs in distribution or in content creation, how do we get the best people working with and for us as an institution? One example um, is ACME, uh, which is the Museum of the Moving Image in Melbourne in Australia. Now, they saw that the definition of the moving image had evolved. Um, and it's, it's quite funny because they, they have a permanent exhibition in their, in their museum of the history of the moving image, but it ends at the iPod. So it ends around the turn of the millennium. And they found it really, really difficult to keep up with technology and how to keep their exhibition relevant going forwards because technology was, was changing so fast. So for an organization like Acme that relies on being um, on top of current technology trends and, te and trends in the worlds of moving image, they see that, that the moving image had evolved from simply TV and film into areas such as virtual and mixed reality, YouTube stars, and a much broader range of distribution platforms and technologies. So to keep up, they realized they had to partner. So we worked with them as Remix to develop and build Acme X, uh, which is the space on the screen behind me. It's the first museum co-working space specializing in the moving image. And they, brought, they bought a large building near the museum and designed it to house around 60 creative entrepreneurs all working in businesses related to the moving image. So things like virtual reality, things like YouTube stars, things like uh, mixed reality, 360 film, a whole range of kind of technologies that they brought into this co-working space owned and run by the museum. And again, the focus for this co-working space was to create a really exciting, brilliant workspace with a lively community, events program built around their needs. And now, rather than Acme as an institution struggling to keep up, struggling to do everything itself in-house with its very small team of people, it was able to attach itself to this network of pioneering entrepreneurs to work with them um, to collaborate with them, to create new ideas for the museum, and also allow them to play with the assets of the museum in order to have new content to use in the very technologies that these uh, companies were creating. So exploring new, new versions of the visitor experience, exploring new versions of content distribution, etc. One of the first examples to come out of it was Ghost Toast and the Things Unsaid. Um, it's a collaboration with Sam Pitt and Google, and this is based on an immersive theatre production where the audience plays the part of a ghost. They're sat on stage while the action takes place around them. Now, unfortunately, in the live theatre experience, only one or two people can do it at any time. So it's a very limited number of people that can experience it. But as the project evolved, the theatre performance, they, they evolved it into a virtual reality experience where millions of users can now experience this theatre production at any time, in any place, using virtual reality. Another, so, uh, sorry, um, another uh, example in Melbourne again is um, the arcade, which this time, rather than specialising in moving image, is specialising in games production. And this, in this case, looking at, again, collaborations with institutions nearby and looking at ways in which gaming can be used. The entrepreneurs that are specializing in gaming can work with institutions to reimagine what the user experience could be around museums. And one of the biggest successes coming out of that space has been Crossy Road, which also recently collaborated with Disney uh, to show the interplay between the commercial and the non-profit opportunities in spaces like this. 
So if we take Acme X and Arcade as an examples, are there particular areas of interest or specialism where our own institutions can build a community of entrepreneurs around us? And it's a genuine partnership in these kind of models. Access to workspace, access to content, access to spaces, access to expertise, access to possibly even resource for the entrepreneur. And in, in turn, access to the innovative startups for the institution, helping them reimagine what the user experience could be. Now, co-working is perhaps is a great way of developing a network of entrepreneurs around an institution. But a slightly deeper form of relationship is through the incubator model. Now, incubators aim to support startups through the very earliest phases, providing skills training along with access to financing and professional networks. The goal is to enable the entrepreneur to survive when it ends the incubation process. So incubators support an entrepreneur for the time it takes to reach a phase of steadiness and survival. Sometimes that can be many years, and particularly in the cultural sector, it can take a long, long time to reach a stage where that entrepreneur is steady and stable to be able to, to self-fund its activities. And an interesting example of this type of model is with the National Theatre in London. And they work with creative entrepreneurs in this way through their immersive story storytelling studio. Now, the remit of the National Theatre is to be a pioneer of dramatic storytelling. So they see digital technologies like virtual reality or 360-degree film and mixed reality as central to achieving their objectives. They don't see digital as a nice-to-have or as an add-on to the theatre experience. Their objective is to be a pioneer of dramatic storytelling, no matter what the form, what the medium. And that's where things like virtual reality or mixed reality or 360 film become so interesting. If we see those as new art forms, utilizing the same types of skills as a theater production would, then all of a sudden we've got a broad new range of opportunities in front of us. In the studio, in the storytelling studio, they bring together technologists with directors, writers, and actors to explore the medium of things like VR in a private setting away from, away from the public. So they try to define some of the new rules of storytelling in these new mediums and consider how traditional theater skills adapt to this new environment. And most recently, they partnered with the Barbican Centre in London to offer a six-month support program for creative entrepreneurs working in this kind of space of immersive storytelling. And then, as a more deeper type of relationship between institution and entrepreneur, we have accelerators. Now, this tend, accelerators tend to target enterprises that have the potential for rapid growth and need advice and guidance on the development or acceleration of their business. Accelerator programs bring together a small number of like-minded startups and put them through a very short but very intensive program, typically about three or six months in duration. And they offer mentoring, they offer training, business development, networking to help drive their development and prepare them for further investment. And they also normally include a financial investment in each organization. Now, typically, accelerators are inspired by Silicon Valley models, and they take an equity position in the businesses which are being supported, which is complicated for nonprofit organizations. Trying to get a museum to take equity in a business is quite a difficult set of circumstances for many, many organizations. And there's been a lot of work by organizations in the UK, like Nesta, to explore this challenge around how equity investments can be made by non-profit organizations and some of the best practice in this sort of space. But so far, the only accelerator in the creative sector that's been able to develop a structural model to invest in private businesses has been Mahuki, which is based at the Te Papa Museum in New Zealand. And Mahuki at the Te Papa in New Zealand is a great example of a museum accelerator. It invites participants to solve problems which Te Papa Museum faces, and in doing so, understands that this can then be applied to thousands of other museums around the world. So they, they're, creating a, they're allowing people to solve problems in their own museum, which they then know can then be sold to other museums globally. 
So they have 12 challenges, and across those 12 challenges, they have 10 teams that get four months support. They each get $20,000. They get support and access to the museum in return for a 6% equity stake. So the museum actually takes a stake in those businesses, which in turn ensures that the museum benefits as those businesses mature and grow. And to set it up, Tipapa partnered with mobile company Vodafone, who invested $150,000. So again, that collaboration between business and culture to create new models of working. And it's a similar way to the way that Bloomberg operates and many other sort of art sponsors, whereby rather than just investing in a new artwork, it's investing in the ecosystem and the infrastructure for creating self-sustaining revenue sources going forwards. Now, the final example around this support of entrepreneurs is looking at early stage creative entrepreneurs. How do we support people like Retronaut, that first example, the guy with a WordPress blog that's a frustrated archivist looking to send his archive, archive, archive photography to millions of people? How do we support people like that that might not even know that they are an entrepreneur or might not define themselves as a creative entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur? How do we enable them to create something new? So in Melbourne, we're working with the State Library of Victoria to create a, co a program called StartSpace. Now, StartSpace is used in the public library network of Victoria to make it the go-to place for entrepreneurial support if you're too small a business or too small an entrepreneur to get that kind of support from premium services like co-working spaces or other sort of or other more established ecosystems for entrepreneurs. So we've, we've got a range of services that we provide at State Library Victoria. Training and events aimed at members to help grow their ideas. Free space, and it's a mix of free space and also premium space for those that can then grow and afford it. We've got it targeted at early stage entrepreneurs. And we've also got a lot of facilities like the town hall space where people can, like here, gather for talks and events, as well as um, creating a new broadcast-enabled learning space. So there are a few pictures on, on screen now of the, the different designs for this, this co-working space within the public library network. But it just creates a very dem democratic way of accessing that business support that doesn't rely on private companies giving it. It's reimagining what business support and information services look like in the public library environment. And it's really fulfilling the mission of public libraries to be the university on the street corner. It's putting information and knowledge at the very center of their objective, in this case, targeted at anyone with a good idea. And it could be an idea for a social enterprise, a business, or a cultural enterprise. In addition to, these, um, in addition to those, we've got several other um, facilities for enabling creative entrepreneurship within the library environment. So we've got maker spaces where people can get access to the latest tools and technologies like 3D printing in order to use those spaces to create new products and, and work with experts in sort of helping hone their ideas and supporting them. We've got immersive classrooms whereby we can explore the future of learning and really learn in new different ways using the latest digital tech. We've got the Creator Studio, um, like the YouTube studios, but done in a public library environment where anyone can get access to things like green screen technology or anyone can get access to broadcast ready cameras or the latest sound technology. If we're providing that through the public library network, we're able to democratize it for anyone to be able to access. Similarly, we've got podcasting studios and recording studios for music, and we've also got visit video editing and animation suites within the public library environment. Really, really exciting times for creative entrepreneurs in Victoria because the Creative Victoria team and the Victorian government have decided to invest millions in the creative entrepreneurship of their state. So, to wrap up, the best digital or arts and tech innovations aren't just add-ons. As we've seen, they're fundamental to the very existence of institutions and the goals and mission of an organization. They help us reach new audiences. They can generate much needed revenue and they can also create big, new, exciting partnerships for us to reimagine what we do as cultural institutions. 
it's easy to try and face, like to try and solve everything ourselves as organizations. But are these, as these examples have hopefully started to show, often partnership is much more powerful as a way to implement innovative new ideas and make them happen. There are now several very well tested models for creative entrepreneurs and institutions to work together and create spaces for the collision of ideas and talents and industries from co-working spaces, social spaces and events, to incubator models and accelerators housed by museums. But central to all of this is this notion of cultural enterprise. Cultural entrepreneurship, as we began, is fundamentally understanding who we are and what assets we have as an organization. What are our cultural ass assets? What makes us as an organization special, unique, different? And that can be applied to anything. As an orchestra, what makes us different to the thousands of other orchestras around the world? What makes us particularly unique and different and special? How can we capitalize on that as the core message for what we are as an organization? Similarly, consumer trends. What are people up to in their everyday lives? What are people doing on the high street, at home, at work, at school? When people step through the doors of a theater or a museum, they don't suddenly switch off from the outside world. They're still the same consumers, the same customers as they are on the high street or at work. We need to be offering the same level of expertise, the same level of experience as every other industry. And as a result, we need to be fully immersed in consumer trends, what people are wanting, what people are needing. And then we find ways of marrying the two, who we are and what we do with what people are after, what people need and want. And that creates opportunities for cultural entrepreneurship. If we're able to understand what we're good at and what people want, we can identify opportunities for new ways of working, and then we can use some of the strategies of entrepreneurs to make ideas happen, to create something out of nothing. Whether that's a beta launch, whereby we launch it at 20% rather than waiting for it to be perfectly polished, or whether it's looking at doing something as a test to get it out there in the marketplace to see people's reactions. There's lots of tried and tested entrepreneurial strategies for making ideas happen without much budget. So money is not the obstacle here, imagination is. What does this result in? Revenue and audiences. Revenue, and this is, and first of all, audiences, it allows us to access new audiences diverse new streams of audiences from a whole range of different places. And then depending on how comfortable we are and how much we want to monetize that relationship, it potentially offers lucrative new revenue streams as well. Now, different institutions have different responses to revenue generation and monetizing that relationship with audience members. But what's important is that the strategies for revenue and income generation are identical to the strategies for audience development and marketing. If we're able to fundamentally understand our users, we're able to create that trusting relationship, we're able to take them on a journey of cultural content, we're able to challenge them and provoke them and inspire them, then we're able to establish that relationship um, and potentially find ways of monetizing that. So that's all for, for this talk. Um, hopefully, we haven't had too much time, so hopefully it's a bit of a quick fire tour around some of the most interesting ways in which we can enable ourselves as institutions to take advantage of this burgeoning space for cultural entrepreneurship. And then in doing so, really helping to solve the problems that we face as cultural organizations, not alone, but in partnership with other creative and cultural entrepreneurs, with technology businesses, and with other corporate brands as well. Thank you very much for listening. I will ask for questions in a second, but um, I very much appreciate you listening, and um, hopefully, hopefully that goes, gives some thought um, for you to go forward with as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. We have time for a few questions. If you want to ask some questions, please raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic. Please speak into the mic so that the interpreter could hear you and translate the question to Simon. Thank you. Hello. 
Thank you very much for your talk. It was very rich, I would say, talk rich with information. My question is the following. How do people find out about all of these opportunities? So how do these creative entrepreneurs find out about these opportunities? Do you do any marketing? Do you distribute the information somehow? So how do people come to these open stasis? Or do they come on their own? Do they just find out out of their own channels? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's it's a very good question because there's, it tackles a lot of issues that institutions face when reaching out to entrepreneurs. And I think the starting point is to say it's very, very, very difficult to go from an institution that has no relationship with entrepreneurs to an institution that's suddenly hosting a co-working space or suddenly a big network of entrepreneurs around it. But I think part of what we've seen with, with some of the examples that I've talked through, one of the mo biggest, most important driving forces is for it to be integrated within the core experience of whether it's a museum or an arts organization or whatever. I think entrepreneurs are very, very good at spotting when there's an opportunity that can um, support them and help them as much as support and help the institution. And we've seen a lot of very bad entrepreneurship support. And that, those very bad types of programs tend to be one way. They tend to be an institution needing to get hold of, in, of entrepreneurs. So they put out an advert saying, come to us entrepreneurs. We'll take all your ideas. We'll hope for the best. And, we'll, it's, and it turns into a very one-way relationship whereby there's no real buy-in from senior leadership at institutions. There's no real support for those entrepreneurs. Um, in a lot of cases, entrepreneurs that we work with say it's very, very difficult to access institutions. Like if you're wanting to, if you've got a great idea for a new type of museum tour, or you've got a great idea for a retail experience or for a live experience in a gallery, how do you begin to speak to a big institution? Like how can you even begin to get access to the right decision maker within that? And a lot of institutions have no answer to that. A lot of institutions on their websites or even through uh, sort of private channels just have no one whose job it is to look for entrepreneurs or to look for collaborations in that sort of space. So the, I'd, I'd look at it from the two angles. On one hand, we've got institutions going in with slightly unrealistic objectives and expectations of just how fundamental how fundamentally different that type of relationship is and how deeply embedded it needs to be within the institution. And on the other hand, we've got entrepreneurs come in with, that, with no way, they hit a brick wall, so therefore, even if they are interested, they don't know who to talk to or where to go. So the best examples we've seen in, in our experience have been where the institutions have gone in and co-developed programs with entrepreneurs. They've, they've worked with either established co-working spaces or established groups of entrepreneurs to design it together, to say, actually, we really want to support you. We don't just want to come up with yet another set of courses for entrepreneurs that 1,001 other people are providing. We want to do something that's really targeted and tailored at what you need. And equally, we want to make it really easy for entrepreneurs to come to us so that anyone with a good idea or anyone who wants to work with us as an institution can see in very big, bold letters that this is where they go. This is the person who's got time in their day job to spend time working with you as an entrepreneur. And that's really, and it's kind of really reaching out to entrepreneurs quite genuinely. And I think that allows, on both sides, the, the opportunity for the two, the two worlds to come together. Um, and it, it, it is a... It's very, very difficult. I think the cultural sector is a uniquely difficult sector for entrepreneurs to penetrate. And there's lots of reasons for that. But I think what's very interesting is that a lot of the entrepreneurs that have been successful have done it despite the institutions rather than because of the institutions. So a lot of the examples we've talked through tonight actually did it on their own first. Um, for like in the case of Retronauts actually got told off by the institutions or told to remove their content or told to go away if they were doing museum tours or whatever. They weren't in partnership at all. And it was only when the institutions saw the success of these entrepreneurs that they then went, kind of went back crawling to say, actually, can we work together because your model was successful, you've brought in new audiences. 
And I think that's symptomatic of us as a sector, the cultural sector, that actually those models do tend to happen outside in spite of institutions. And entrepreneurs will find a way. And they will, that's the nature of entrepreneurship. They will overcome those kind of challenges. Um, but it would be nice to actually, for institutions to get in there earlier, before it's a success story, before it's already well established, and just be very open and have lots of open doors and lots of open conversations to try and get in there early with entrepreneurs in order to co-develop those kind of opportunities with them. Any other questions? Um. <laughs> this one. one at the back. Good evening, thank you very much for your talk. I wanted to ask you about state support and state funding. You omitted it on your talk, so I wanted to ask you, do you think it's the right strategy in a way, so should we focus on state funding? Uh, uh, thank you for your question. I think it's... Um, the, the short answer is yes, but it, I, I would say it needs to be part of a mix of funding. And I think there's a lot of talk about this idea of a mixed ecology of funding. Um, in the UK, because of a lot of government funding cuts in the 80s, we've developed a model where it's roughly a third, a third, a third. So a third of funding from uh, state support, a third of funding from sponsorship, and a third of funding from earned income and commercial revenue, like box office and retail, etc. And that seems to be working well. Um, I'd say where, and I'm, I'm quite biased in this, but I think that the most interesting innovations tend to be happening in the earned revenue space. It's where there's a lot more freedom for the enterprise teams or for the development teams to really push innovation in different directions that isn't, that isn't needing to meet the expectations of particular funders. And I think with state funding, very, very, very important, particularly for R&D funding and research and development funding. But where it becomes quite dangerous is when, when objectives change or where strategies change and, and you end up in a situation whereby the organization is being led by the funder as opposed to the organization standing for its own priorities and objectives. And we see that a lot in, in the sector where the, the objectives of the funder override the objectives of the institution. And the best institutions have managed to free up enough financial space to be able to be their own bosses, to be their own masters. And I think that's where things like sponsorship, but also, most importantly, earned revenue become really important to free up that space for innovation and free up that space to, to do what they want as organizations without having to necessarily answer to a funder or to a corporate sponsor. And a final thing on that, I would also say, a lot, of, a lot of the most interesting uh, work is where we're seeing the subsidy of commercial art forms to underpin more niche art forms. And I mentioned Secret Cinema as a great example of that. They've got blockbuster Star Wars shows that are paying for very niche short film production. And I think that's a great example. It happens on lots of different scales. That's a big scale example where they're generating millions in box office revenue for a very commercial activity, but that directly invests millions into short film production, which otherwise wouldn't get that kind of funding. And that's a perfect example where we can sort of create a menu of, of services and options, some more commercial, some more niche or specialist. And I think that's where it becomes really exciting to be more sort of nuanced with our financial planning. Hello, good evening. Uh, do you monitor 
the results of projects being initiated. So what's the percentage of the successful projects that come out of all these incubators, all of these creative ideas? So do you follow the fate, so to speak, of all these innovative projects? Thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it, it's a good question. And um, when we support the creation of incubators like Acme X, or we've just done one at a performing arts center as well, um, one of the most important things is setting expectations around the failure rate. It's really, really hard to be an entrepreneur, and it's even harder to be an entrepreneur in the creative and cultural sectors. The the failure rate is extremely high. And in the UK, you're lucky if you survive the first two years, never mind, so beyond that. So I think having going in with realistic expectations of what failure looks like and, and also understanding that failure is part of the journey of an entrepreneur, that one idea might not be successful, but that teaches a whole load of experience and lessons for the next idea to be slightly more successful and then the next idea to be more successful and so on and so forth. And so to answer the question, we, um, because we, we're not sort of been running the incubation spaces ourselves, although monitoring and evaluation is in critical to the success of those, not least to attract future entrepreneurs. However, I think just as important is understanding when you're setting up these kind of support services, this kind of the nature of success in the entrepreneurial space and understanding that it is a very, very difficult journey, which is why so few people are entrepreneurs. Most of us prefer to just work in a normal job for a living. We don't want to take on all that risk, all that personal risk and liability, which is why so few people, so few people do it, but then even fewer are successful at it. So I think if we've got an institution that understands that and goes into that very aware and with their eyes open, that's where the best kind of collaborations happen. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you very much for your talk. My question is continuing the previous one. What are your basic KPIs when your projects are being implemented? Do you use any system of KPIs or can they be used in such creative projects at all? Um, it's, it's a Difficult question to answer. Thanks for thanks for the question. Um, and the, the reason I say that is not to not to cop out, not to <laughs> not to uh, not to avoid the question. But I think the nature of entrepreneurship is a very difficult one to kind of put into statistical boxes. And what we've seen on countless number of projects is that halfway through the project, it changes direction completely and you end up with an outcome that's very, very different to what you imagined you were going to start with. And therefore, some of the best evaluation metrics and the best KPIs that we've seen are ones that can actually evolve with a project rather than being fixed at the outset and then not changing as the project goes on. So before I, before I started Cultural Able uh, about 15 years ago now, I used to work, my, my job was in evaluation and, and setting KPIs. Um, and it was, and we were doing it for a national funder in the UK, uh, looking at thousands of projects that were being funded and coming up with the right KPIs for that. And even then, even if it was state funding as opposed to, in this case, kind of entrepreneurial funding, the nature of institutions and the nature of, of kind of the challenges involved with getting a program from start to finish are so difficult and so different to normal scenarios that I think it's very, very dangerous to have a very rigid evaluation structure. Um, and so the, where, I, where I would sort of put emphasis is on looking at some of the outcomes that are less expected. So for example, we just mentioned the, the examples of failure. Um, if an entrepreneur, if an enterprise doesn't succeed, it's just as important to get the, the lessons and, and learning out of why it hasn't succeeded, but then push that back into the system so then it's, it's not just lost knowledge. And I think that the ability to actually create systems, processes that capture that information to find out why something failed, but then also do something about it and pass that knowledge on to future entrepreneurs becomes a really interesting one to try and design as a, as a process. Um, and where, like some of the projects I can, I can um, sort of reference as, as particular examples, 
one particular project we were running uh, was looking at experience products and repackaging arts experiences for high street audiences as experience products. So rather than just going to a spa or rather than going for a day playing golf or whatever it may be, how do we package a cultural experience as a unique experience rather than just sort of tell, selling theatre tickets? And one of the challenges, one of the biggest unexpected consequences of that that we came up against that we weren't imagining in the least when we started was actually it ran into lots of opposition with membership teams because most of the institutions we were working with were entirely geared up to sell private memberships so to, to individuals or corporate members. So therefore, the entire institution was focused on member events or member sales or member opportunities. So to come in with an offer for VIP experiences or to come in with an offer for something very different meant that there was a fundamental challenge to some of those membership options and some of those membership structures. Now, we, we went through a whole series of how to solve that, but in terms of your question, the we didn't expect to come up against that. That wasn't something we'd, we'd planned at the outset. And the nature of the whole project turned and, and changed as a result of coming up against that big challenge. And I think it was a very, very valuable project to go through that experience and to come up with some of the solutions. But if we'd have been ticking boxes against KPIs, we probably would have been a failure of a project. And I think that's where it becomes quite an interesting discussion to see how we can change the process and to, to continually monitor how things are evolving as well as where they've started from. Okay. Hello. My question is this. So your target audience is English speaking and that's quite a big market. And I think it's quite advanced as for virtual and internet technologies. Maybe you have some experience or you know other companies that worked in France or in Germany or in Italy, so to speak, in less advanced and narrow markets that speak, for example, for um, yeah, for the audience that speaks uh, non-major language, like the Russian language. It's not such a big market as English speakers. And also in Russia, not too many people use VR and use Internet, unfortunately. So what's your suggestion how to deal with such markets? Thank you for the question. Um, we. I, I would question the question, to be honest, because I, I think that the, the nature of the audience in, other, in, in any country we look at has got... I, and I, well, let me start. I, I think the question can be looked at from two ways. If we're looking at it from the cultural sector looking outwards, I think it'd be a very different question to if we're talking to people on the high street or exploring what they're doing sort of in their daily lifestyles. And I don't believe for a second that mobile isn't prevalent in Russia. And I don't believe for a second that people aren't excited by new technology in Russia. And I don't believe for a second that OKVR OK, hasn't taken off yet, but it hasn't in England either. It hasn't really in the US. It's only a few kind of pioneers that are pushing it at the moment. So. There's a, I would argue there's a very similar level of excitement and there's a very similar ability to engage with these types of technologies. But I think the, the fundamentals of the, of the question are, are key as to how, how we engage with people in their everyday experiences. And they might not be, to your, to your point, they might not be as excited by technology trends. That, that might be a fair enough observation. But if they're not, then they'll be excited by something else. And I don't know what that something else is. It might be retail, or it might be education, or it might be charity en engagement, or it might be public space. There'll be other things that excite those users that you can use as a replacement for technology. And what the whole model of cultural entrepreneurship seeks to do is to look at what we've got as a cultural organization and apply it to where people's heads are at, where people's excitement levels are at, and find ways of combining the two. And I take your point that that might not be technology, but it will be something else. And so I think the core model works very well. We've seen it in social enterprise as a, as a good sort of alternative model, whereby people are engaging with their local communities or are wanting to give back to society. 
And the same sort of models work there, where if we, we can get the best social impact and the best social out action, if we understand what people are getting most um, aggrieved by or most excited by in their social environment, as well as what we, what we have as cultural organizations. So I think the model still works, but I, I take your point, it might be slightly different around uh, technology. Thank you very much. We have time for one final question. Simon, Simon, could you please tell us how you managed to overcome the inertia of museums and other cultural institutions? Good question. Thank you. Um, the honest answer is we haven't. Um, and where we... Where all of these examples, we, we, we're not the sort of, we're not the people doing the most exciting work. The people doing the most exciting work are the individuals that are doing it within their institution or the individual creative entrepreneurs that are doing it against the odds. Um, and where, where these projects and ideas and initiatives tend to succeed and happen, where individuals are battling that inertia from within their organizations or doing it even though organizations won't partner with them. And I think that's a sign of a great entrepreneur or a great entrepreneur um, where people just make it happen and despite challenge after challenge after inertia after inertia coming up against them, they're able to find ways of navigating the system or they're able to find ways of going around the outside of the system in order to make an idea happen. And that is, for me, fundamental to entrepreneurship. If we have to wait for permission, or we have to wait for funding, or we have to wait for anything, then chances are it's not ever going to happen. Whereas if we're able to act like a true entrepreneur and make it happen irrespective, there are always, there's always a way of making it happen, and there's always a way of getting the right partners on board, or getting the right leverage, or getting the right momentum in order to make it happen. And where these projects have all succeeded is where there's been a single or a few people driving those ideas forward, because they're going to make those ideas happen no matter what inertia they, they face. I'm afraid our time is up, so please come up to Simon individually if you feel like asking any question. We have to finish our talk here, and I would like to thank Simon again for a brilliant talk.